From a professional point of view, could you give us a brief overview of South Africa's economic situation and what exactly this means for the country and those who live in it? So I would call it a very, um, we're in a very tough place at the moment. Um, not only have we gone through almost a whole decade of what I would call subpar growth, so growth that's not good enough, um, but the outlook is also unfortunately extremely weak. And the reason this is troublesome to people living in South Africa is because it's one thing to look at real GDP growth, and that's what we always tend to do. And, you know, 10 years ago, we hoped for 3% growth. That was always the magic number. Nowadays, it seems that if South Africa achieves 1%, um, you know, it's something we applaud ourselves for. But unfortunately, when you go down 10 years um, and you slow down that quickly and your population growth is growing quicker, then real per capita growth is going to be incredibly low. So low that on some measures, it's actually contracting or falling in negative terms. And what that essentially means is that for 10 years now, the man on the street has not felt wealthier, has not felt more prosperous about his or her own economic well-being. And that then spills over into a more frustrated um, socio-political South Africa, where you might have realized that um, more recently, I would say South Africa has found its voice. People are protesting more. People are speaking out over some of government's policy decisions, such as the VAT hike, such as the fuel price. And whether that's correct or not correct still gets you down to the fact that people have not experienced sufficient growth for almost a decade. And looking forward, it's also then difficult to see how you get much better growth in South Africa that can actually make up for the loss that they felt over the decade. So I would say that's unfortunately how the spillover has happened and that's the problem South Africa faces now. <clears throat> uh, could you tell us a bit about the weak GDP outlook for South Africa and why this is now critically important for South Africa's socio-political direction? Do you think this will improve going forward? So we do see a slight improvement. So right now we've got 0.8% on the cards for growth this year in South Africa. Next year we've penciled in something slightly above 1%. And the year after it's slightly below 2%. So it does improve, but whether you call that improvement or not comes down to whether people feel it. So again, similar to the story about real per capita growth, is this sufficient growth to make people feel better? Because otherwise, you're going to start seeing that way on policy decisions. So if you think about the problem with growth at the moment, why it's so weak, is that South Africa's got itself into a somewhat of a vicious circle. We've always looked at the consumer as almost two thirds of economic growth to almost save us, because we know with consumers, if they get a bit of extra money at the end of the month, they don't save it, it goes straight into the retail sector and that spending gives you a lot of growth. So if inflation slows quite dramatically, or if wages rise very quickly, well, you can quite easily get growth in South Africa. Unfortunately, now, the incomes that consumers receive are very limited, more so than ever before. Because you haven't had sufficient growth for a whole decade, we've lost a lot of confidence. And the loss of that confidence I'm talking about is not so much consumer confidence as much as I'm referring to business confidence. If businesses cannot see reason to expand on both capital, which would be capex, infrastructure, or labor, which would be jobs, well then unfortunately, that's going to add to what I would say we already have massive lacking jobs or job creation in South Africa. So if, you, if, if businesses are constrained, and they can't hire easily, and they can't pay their current existing staff uh, more rapidly, well then consumer income is immediately limited. Then it's going to be um, a function of what inflation's doing. And inflation in South Africa looks quite low because if it's printing anywhere between you know, five and 6% relative to our history, we see that as low. But in actual fact, we've got a midpoint of four and a half percent in the three to six percent target range. So it's actually not low. 
Um, it has become lower because there's no demand in the economy. So retailers don't find it as easy to pass through inflation as they did before. But at the same time, why is it still above 4.5%? Because this economy is still largely inefficient. So that's the, the, the bind we're in in South Africa. How can we convince corporate South Africa to do more? Well, in the end, they will do more if there is growth, if there's a policy framework to expand in. But if they're concerned about the outlook, if they don't feel more profitable from one quarter to the next, why would they expand? And then that places a massive ceiling on top of household consumption. So that's why we've been weak. And that's probably why we will stay weak until we can find what we all refer to as structural growth from reform. <clears throat> oh, we've got the, the mini budgets coming up on Wednesday. Why would you say it's more difficult to, to forecast some of these numbers than what it used to be? So in the past, where every time we looked at the budget, so you get the big February national budget. Um, and then, of course, in October, we have the mini budget where it gives Treasury an opportunity to look at what's changed over the last six months and to update the budget accordingly. Now, if you think back maybe five, ten years ago, things didn't change in South Africa as quickly as they were changing, well, right now. So five, ten years ago, when we looked at a budget, we would obviously look at the, your year-to-date figures um, from Treasury in terms of revenue collection and expenditure. We'd work out, track how much revenue, for example, was above or, or below that of Treasury's estimates. And then you would forecast based on the GDP outlook what the rest of the year would do. And you'd pretty much get to the number, and that's why forecasts very much mimicked what Treasury was presenting. The recent budgets, I would say over the last maybe two to three years and going forward, have become ever more complicated to forecast is because there is a lot of policy change going on in South Africa. I'll give you an example. So our president has recently come out with an economic stimulus package whereby it's supposed to be fiscally neutral, which means we're not spending more money in South Africa because we don't know where to find that money. But they're going to take the current spending and they're going to reprioritize 50 billion. So that means they'll take the 50 billion from inefficient areas that don't give you much growth. And they're going to send it hopefully to efficient areas of spending that will have a good multiplier effect that gives you growth. We don't know what exactly that additional growth is going to be from the 50 billion. And that will feed through into Treasury's forecast for growth, which will also then feed through to their revenue assumptions going forward. Another example is um, Spectrum. We've heard a lot about the, the telecommunications sector and how we could possibly be auctioning off um, more space for broadband, and that can bring down your data costs. So there are lots of assumptions you'd have to build into that without knowing when is it actually going to happen. Because when it does happen, you're likely to get quite a helpful fiscal injection into the budget. But we don't know exactly how much that is. Is it 10 billion? Is it 30 billion? The timing is important too. That's another element to make it more difficult to forecast. And, and I'll add in just one last one. We had a VAT hike in February, 1%. And we've got revenue assumptions running off that. But now we've got an additional list of items to be zero rated because, rightly so, people found a voice and said, this isn't good enough. But we don't know what exactly those zero, right, uh, zero rated additional items are. And that is going to have implications for VAT revenue going forward. So it's not that you mustn't forecast the budget. It's important to do so, but it's also very important to understand the various scenarios that could, you could form over the next three years, depending which policy choices the president and government makes. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, what exactly does, what impact does this have on South Africa's potential new equilibrium? So by, by equilibrium, so let's maybe just start there. There are very technical ways to work out an equilibrium for a country. People often, the most, the most common one people use is, is the fair value for the RAND. The fair value for the RAND is ultimately an equilibrium level for the RAND to revert back to once it's no longer being shocked by something. So by equilibrium for an economy, the easiest way to get to that without becoming too technical is 
to think that maybe five years ago, if we sat down and quickly tried to describe South Africa, I'd guess most people would say, well, it's a 2.5% GDP growth economy, the budget deficit's usually about negative 3% of GDP, the current account deficit equilibrium is around the same, negative 3% of GDP, and fair value currency, rand dollar, is somewhere around 11, 11.50. You know, that's generally the numbers people would describe South Africa as being at an equilibrium level five years ago. But if we agree that this economy, at least for the next three years, is going to average around 1% growth, then those equilibrium levels have changed. And then suddenly, if this is a 1% GDP growth economy, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get to a 3% budget deficit to GDP ratio. If anything, something with a 4 in front of it looks more likely. But until you've um, adjusted to that new equilibrium level, you're going to trade as an economy on a much higher form of macroeconomic risk, which can spill over, obviously, into volatility that you see in the currency. That makes us very nervous about what exactly could the trigger be to move us to that new equilibrium, which is why we concern so much always about Moody's, because that could be a trigger. When Moody's eventually downgrades South Africa because it might not be able to achieve what it currently says it will, well, that's going to cause quite a different repricing of the economy. And I think we've all come to terms to understand that if Moody's downgrades South Africa and that within junk across all agencies, well, obviously the currency will not only depreciate in one go, but probably change its equilibrium level until you can get an upgrade again. So that has massive implications for the economy because that means if you do have to adjust to a new equilibrium, it means that at some point, this economy will feel quite a lot of pain. It's what most economies go through. I wouldn't go so far as to call it an outright crisis because we still have um, very uh, firm monetary policy. We have very prudent uh, people in the finance ministry and none of them would think about not stepping in on a situation like that. But to adjust to an equilibrium, it does take a certain amount of pain. And if that does come with potentially higher inflation from the weak currency, uh, potentially job loss um, from the shock to the economy, well, that's going to be felt um, by the man on the street.